there are things that, you know, what is a fairly straightforward technical analysis gives us insights to many other aspects of the world around us generally, but specifically in terms of uh, things that you need to be thinking about as an entrepreneur in life sci early life sciences companies. Um, I've tried, some of these slides are a bit dense uh, because I want you to be able to have these and be able to read them later and kind of make sense of them rather than just me talking to kind of one word bullet points. So um, you probably won't be able to take in everything on the slide, but I'll, I'll talk through the main points. And then separately, some of this involves kind of Excel files, and so I will send you the kind of the backup Excel files so you can play with them uh, and email me questions. Um, so when we were designing the outline of today, um, you know, you heard from Ilan earlier that was really talking about what it is you've got to do to get to a kind of a commercial product. And then you just heard health economics about what it is you need to shoot for to be able for, for someone to want to pay you money for your product. And you heard about this, again, slightly abstract concept of a, of a quality of life year. Uh, you know, it's not just good enough to, um, uh, for your drug to be doing something. It needs to be better than the standard of care. And you're measured both on, um, you know, on an analytical basis. Um, and so if you're not, if you're never, the point about this is if you're never going to get to a, it to a product that's going to fundamentally change healthcare, don't even bother. If you're going to produce something that is a novel mechanism but does the same as other products already out there, then no one's going to pay you for it. NICE is not going to pay you for it. You know, and there's a, there's a bit of a misnomer about the US market as a, as a kind of gravy train of, well, if I get it approved, I'm going to be paid for it. That might have been true 20 years ago, but it is not true today. You, although they, the way that the market's structured is very different in the US, they are still very much looking at the same principles, cost benefit. So you have to really believe today that, if you're, going to, that you're going to produce something that's fundamentally different in terms of clinical effect to everything out there, regardless of what modality it is. You're not competing against another antibody, you're also competing against a medical device that's trying to save the prob same problem. Lifestyle choices, potentially. So you have to think about all of those to get these guys to pay, to pay for you. What I'm going to talk about is how you get there in terms of the financing element of it. And it all comes down to fundamental value. You're asking commercially orientated people, whether they are venture capitalists like me, or you do a partnership with a pharma company like Johnson & Johnson, in the end, their shareholders, the people who have given them money, to, uh, are only interested in really one thing, and it's a bit brutal, but it's the bottom line. Can you, cre can you create value for them? And that concept of value is a bit nebulous. And until you can actually pin it down and measure it, you don't really know where you stand. And it's especially complex when you're at the stage you all are, right at the beginning of this process, where you've got a long slog that Elan laid out. Uh, you know, what is the value of your company? How does an investor value your company? And at what stages are there value inflection points? And why? Because unless you can make all those dots line up, you're going to get to a point where no one wants to give you any more money and your product is going to fail. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, as I said, it's a bit abstract to start with, but bear with me. I will try and at the end tie it all together and, uh, and you'll, you'll understand why I'm banging on about it. Um, OK, so fundamentally, you're no longer research scientists here. You're not pursuing knowledge for knowledge's sake. You are business people. And creating value is the unifying concept of what business enterprise is about. Um, I'm going to talk about how we assess value. And we assess value for many different reasons, not just to value something for its own sake. We use it as a decision-making tool. Uh, and this is the fundamental uh, basic analysis we use. It's called a discounted cash flow an an uh, analysis. And the underlying 
concept that drives that is called the time value of money. Uh, some, of, some of you may have heard of some of this, so I apologize if it's a bit basic to start with, but many of you, I think, won't have done. And then within that general concept, which, of, which drives everything from consumer products to, um, to healthcare, biotech speci specifically has a few nuances that take um, need, need adjustments to that concept. And then I'm going to tell you why, once you've understood the fundamentals, that this suddenly makes everything else that happens in the development pathway, the reimbursement pathway, make sense. Okay. So, so as I said, the goal of everything that we do in business is to make, to create monetary value for its share, shareholders. We just happen to be doing that in healthcare. This concept of being able to measure value allows decision making, however. It's not just about saying how much I'm going to pay for something. Do I build a new factory? It's all about, is that a value creating decision? You roll out a new training, an employee training program, it's a different type of value. You know, you're, you, you have an expense in terms of the paying for the program, but as a result, your employees become more efficient or happier, and you don't have, they don't leave as quickly. All of these things are a very uh, diverse set of decisions that any company faces, but in the end, at their heart, is does this create value? And so being able to measure it allows you to make that decision. So, a very basic example, so we're going to go this quickly, is, you know, a guy, I specifically chose an example that's nothing to do with healthcare, because it illustrates that it's broadly applicable. So, a guy in his shed makes a table. It costs him a certain amount in terms of wood and materials. It takes him an amount of time, I've said five hours. He could have been doing something else with that time, driving an Uber cab. Um, he had to rent some space. He sold it for 300 pounds. He had to pay a bit of tax. And on the bottom is a graph of, of the economics of that, um, of that process. So in the end, his total costs, uh, sorry, he sold it for 300 pounds. Those were his total costs in the end, and he made 84 pounds in five hours. Instead, he could have been working in, work, driving an Uber cab for 10 pounds an hour, so his decision to make the table was a value-creating decision. That should be pretty straightforward. Um, so, first of all, an introduction to financial statements. On the left is what we call a profit and loss statement. It's effectively a numerical representation of the graph that I showed you and the events that happened. And this is how we analyze and measure businesses. They produce audited financial statements, um, which allow us to interpret what's going on within a business. Um, I'm not going to go through this. And you can read it on the slide, but balance sheet and cash flow statements are, and shareholders' equity are the other side of things. But really, this is the basic format in which, you, which, we, uh, which we lay things out. You've got revenue at the top. You take out the costs uh, here, and you end up, once you've paid some, ink, some uh, corporate tax, you end up with your profit of 84. So it, it's just cutting it another way into, into numbers. And we use that as the fundamental construct of how we analyze companies, business opportunities, decisions um, in, all, in all respects, in healthcare and everything else. Um, so let's say this carpenter decides that was actually a pretty good thing. I made a lot more money making my table and I had a lot more fun than driving a cab, um, so I'm going to do it more. So 2015, he says, I'm going to have a really good, big go at this, and he ends up making and selling 100 tables. Um, and he thinks that, well, and his intention is to continue to do that. Let's say another company, a larger company, a design company, is looking for young, interesting brands that it wants to buy, and they notice him at a kind of trade fair or something, and they're thinking, hmm, he would fit very well with what we've got. Why don't I try and buy him and bring him into our company? To make that decision on whether they do it, they need to work out what is the fundamental value of paying this person a load of cash up front with what they're going to end up making 
by selling his products within their company down the line. For it to become a value creative decision, they need to have negotiated a, a price to buy the company that is less than the fundamental value of the company itself. So, and, and in doing so will have created value. So they don't want to pay the same, they don't want to pay more, they have to pay less, and in doing so it's a value creating decision. I'm not going to take you through all the details, but again, if we roll, sorry, um, on the left is the P&L that I talked about earlier. Then what we do is we just, we forecast how this is going to look as the years go out for this business. And we've just put in some very basic assumptions that he's going to grow at 20% a year in terms of the number of tables he builds. And it's very straightforward. It just falls out of kind of Excel. And at the bottom, you have your uh, cash flow the profit that falls down in the end. So we've made some very basic assumptions, and what that ends up as, in 10 years' time, his profit has grown from uh, 6,800 here in a year to 29,300 over here. And so we've just predicted that this is what the business is going to look like on, a, on financial terms. So that doesn't tell us how much the business is worth, though. That just tells us what's going to happen. So how do we know how much it's worth? If we, if we actually just said, OK, well, why wouldn't you just add up all of these numbers? So once we've paid all our costs, this is the amount of money that would be flowing into our bank accounts. If we did that, uh, we'd have ended up with uh, 190,000 pounds. So maybe they should pay that. But that's not correct, because what we haven't, the two issues that don't, this doesn't account for one is, hopefully the world does not end in 2025. And then secondly, we have this slightly abstract concept called the time value of money. And the fundamental principle of that is that 100 pounds today is worth more than 100 pounds in 10 years' time. And there are a number of drivers of that concept, one being risk, obviously. If I'm the guy promising you 10, 100 pounds in 10 years' time, I might have run off to Brazil and not turn up to give you your money in 10 years' time. But let's just say the, 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 you are borrowing money from the UK government, and they can just print money if they're out of money, so there's no risk of you never getting it. There's still this concept of the time value of money. And it really comes down to something we call opportunity cost. What else could you have been doing with your money in the meantime? The basic thing you could be doing is you put £100 in a bank account. I think today it's even hard to find 2% interest in a bank account, but nonetheless, um, let's just say you got 2%. In 10 years' time, that £100 would have grown into £122, and having taken no risk, because the bank is backed by the government, the government has kind of infinite resources of money, so there's no risk on that basis. So if £100 is going to grow into £122 in 10 years' time, you'd obviously rather have £100 today that you can then put into your bank account than only get £100 kind of out in 2025. So putting it another way, if you just reverse that formula, um, £122 in 2025 is actually worth a, only worth £100 today. Any questions on that? Does anyone, does the people follow out that hopefully should be reasonably straightforward? Um, so if you understand that, you can understand everything that kind of flows out of this analysis. So we apply the same logic to the carpentry business. However, it's not a bank. It's a business. It's a startup business at that. So its risk is higher than zero. And so we apply a higher discount rate. In this case, I've chosen 15%. We also need to account for the fact that hopefully this is what we call a going concern, and it's going to continue to grow beyond 2025, for which we assume a kind of infinite growth uh, number. And because of the discounting, it ends up being a, a rational number that you can end up with, and I'll show you that. So what we've done is exactly the same kind of statement of cash flows come across here, we've used a 15% discount rate and just divided 
um, over here, this is the, the accumulative effect of number of years that you're dividing your discount factor into it. So 10 years out at a 15 10% discount rate, the 29,000 is only worth 7.2 on today's money, assuming you've got 15% discount rate. So what that's saying is, if I promised to give you, if I, if I gave you 7.2 thousand pounds today, and you went into the stock market and invested in a high growth tech startup, you'd expect that in 2025, that money would have grown into 29.3. So if I'm gonna promise you 29.3 in 2025, I'm only gonna pay you 7.2 for it today. We following? Excellent. Uh, and then you can play with the Excel formula, but this is something that uh, drives the terminal value. So we add up the sum of these discounted cash flows, what we call them, add them to the terminal value, which is from 2025 into infinity, and you end up with your <coughs> net, total net present value, which is 138,000. So that's what we call the fundamental value of this carpentry business. Sorry, I went through that. Yeah. So, oh, this is what I've just described. Um, so I've told you that this really is not about um, specifically valuing something. It's about a decision-making tool. So what... Uh, design company A has done is run his analysis on the, the future assumptions of, your, of this business or your business and he thinks it's worth 138,000 um, in principle. So should he pay that, offer that to the entrepreneur? No, he shouldn't because if he did that, he'd be exchanging one asset, 138,000 pounds of cash for another asset worth 138,000 in future revenues, and you haven't created any value at all. So what you need to do is therefore offer less, and then that comes down to negotiation with the entrepreneur. And what you end up agreeing, in terms of how value creative it will be, is what are the op other opportunities that the design company has in terms of other places it could deploy its capital and create value. So if the difference was only 2%. If he only managed to negotiate 130,000 as the, the, the final price that he could get, and it was a two, you know, that margin was the value he could create in this decision, but he could buy another company and make a kind of 40% creation value, he'd do that. Likewise, the entrepreneur, you guys, will have your own financial aspirations, you know, your number to go and sit on a beach and never, never wear a suit again. Um, that will drive your side of the bargain. And then it also, can you, can you draw together other companies to competitively uh, bid on your company? And that's the negotiation side of things. Biotech is a little different, though. So as we've heard, it's a long, this, and I'm going to talk about therapeutics, but it obviously applies to devices in a slightly different construct, health IT, there will be a few years of development, but it is quite a different animal. But nonetheless, the DCF is still what drives decision making. Um, so because there's going to be a long time before we get to market, unlike a carpenter who builds his table and then sells it, you've got 8 to 12 years of pouring money into what is often seems like a bottomless pit uh, with... with <laughs> very little reassurance that you'll ever get to a point where anybody's going to give you any money at all for your product. And a lot of these things fail on the way. And they can fail very early, that it turns out that your kind of mouse uh, keels over and dies. Uh, or you could be in the middle of Elan's 15,000 patient cardiovascular phase three trial, and it turns out that you're no better than the placebo arm. So in both of those scenarios, You'll have spent different amounts of money, but you'll also have never ended up with any revenue. Painful. Um, so, um, that's, hang on, that's just what I've said. So we need to adjust our analysis. And the reason 
we need to adjust our analysis is that each prediction comes with a different probability of ever actually occurring. When we start with your models in mice, we know we're going to spend that money because we have to test whether we think it's going to work or not. And if it doesn't work, well, we, we won't spend any more money. This is a chart. You can't read it from up there, but you'll have it that takes industry historical average data on the probability of success of a drug going through from start to finish and, and the amounts of time. Um, so what you can see is uh, here, basically, when you cut, it, cut through it, and this is quite generous, I think, 5% of all companies that kind of enter a preclinical discovery type stage will ever produce a drug will ever get to the end. So what you can say at that point is that if we think that your drug is going to change the world, cure cancer, have a billion dollars in revenue, there's only a 5% chance based on the, the numbers that that cash flow will ever actually occur. However, you know you're going to spend the first stage, so there's 100% certainty you're going to spend $5 million on running a load of mouse models. So we add a separate... Uh, and this is quite depressing, by the way. But, uh, and this is also generous. I think people would more likely say that this number down here, which is when you add up everything that's going on, is more like $2 billion to produce a drug. And that number there is more like 1% to 2%. So I'm being nice. Um, so this is the same thing. It's a little longer, so I've split it into two, because drugs you know, take 10 years to develop. And then hopefully, you do eventually get some revenue. So, I've just split it into, into two so you can put it on the same page. You obviously can't read it from up there. But what I'm going to highlight is we've added two more steps. Well, one more step and two things on it. Um, we add underneath you've got your kind of what you think your cash flow are. And in, in, in drug development, you'll see for the entire of the of, uh, duration of the top that everything's negative. In financial modeling, we put brackets. Uh, negative numbers are in brackets. Um, so you've just got negative 1, 5, 5, 5, 10, 10, 10, 50, 50, 50, a little bit of kind of prepare to go to sale. And it's only down here 10 years, uh, 12 years later that you start getting a little bit of cash flow. Uh, here we go. But you know, ultimately, you end up to a billion dollars of cash flow because your product is changing the world. So that's great. But as I said, there's 100% certainty we're going to call it, we're going to spend the first kind of three years of money. So you've got him raised from Jens. You've charmed him. He's given you $15 million to go and run your animal data, medicinal chemistry, whatever it is you happen to be doing. Um, so we know there's a 100% chance that that's going to happen because he's already given you the check and you've got the check and guess what? You're going to spend it. Um, however, only about, going back to this chart, only about 20% of companies make it through from the preclinical into a going into man setting. So there's only a 20% chance that these cash flows are going to happen because you've probably, Jens has probably made a bad decision and uh, backed the wrong horse and he's written off all his money. Um, so, but 20% of you will actually get into, into humans. Now, we're still talking about negative numbers here, and it gets, as Elon said, it gets more expensive. As you move into phase one and into people, now you're talking about 10 million a year. And ultimately, in phase three, you're talking about 50 million a year. But there's only a 20% chance that that's going to happen. So the 10 million only ends up as negative two here, which is... Which sounds like a good thing. And it is, to some extent. And as you go through, you, you end up with, although you're spending 50 million a year, on a, based on today, when you're looking at it from here, they're only actually impacting you by negative three because there's so little probability that they're actually going to happen. So great. Wonderful. I can get away with only a 3% hit to my present value when, I'm going to be, when I know I'm going to be spending $50 million. Wonderful. However, if we took it out, look it out here uh, where we are earning a billion dollars of revenue a year with a really chunky... Uh, operating margin, so you're earning $500 million of cash flow straight into your pocket because you've changed the world. 
there's only a 5% probability that these ever exist. And on a, based on 5% probability that they ever exist, that translates into $25 million. It's still not bad, right? But I just told you about the time value of money. And uh, $25 million in 2020, wherever we ended up, 2036, when the patent expires, is only worth $1 million. So a billion dollars of revenue, which sounds like the dream, is actually only worth $1 million when you add it up. When you discount it for the likelihood it will ever occur, and then you discount it for the time value of money. And when you add up all of those risk-adjusted net present values, they all start negative here, and then they get positive here. But even though, as I said, you're doing a really good job, because you, and you've done what you promised everybody you would, and no one would believe you except Jens, um, you add all those up, and you end up with this company is worth $4 million. For a company that's going to produce billions of dollars of revenue, cure thousands of patients of cancer, that's how, that's what fundamental value tells you your product is worth. Don't get too depressed. This is, this is, it's a better story. This, this is a better story. As it happens, uh, well, I'll tell you that in a second. Hang on. Let's just move forward. So that is the, that's the fundamental analysis. It gets used for valuing stuff. But the reason I want to talk to you about it is because of the implications that it, can, it informs us of lots of different dynamics along the way that should be relevant to you today. I'll actually say that no one will value your company today using this analysis. So it's not even relevant as it happens because there are so many assumptions built into, into this and the movement of one will either make your, value, your company worth 50 million or negative 50 million. So it, I've kind of fiddled the numbers so I get to just about positive. But, um, so no one actually will value your company on the basis of this in terms of actually doing the analysis. They'll do it on looking at other companies that got financed, what were they valued at? Yours looks kind of similar. Is, are you, have you done this multiple times before, therefore I'll give you a higher likelihood that you'll make it, and therefore I'll give you a bit more valuation? So no one's actually, don't be scared, no one's actually gonna do this to your company today, but the underlying principles of what it represents drive how they will think about your business and how you should think about your business. So that was a bit quick, but um, I wanted to get through that so we can talk in more detail about, um, about why it's important. So this is the point about, you know, billion dollar drug only worth $4 million at the start. That said, that should inform you, um, you should think about that when you enter into negotiations with your investors. So you'll be coming to the table with a, I know this is gonna work. I know this, this uh, gene therapy, no one else has managed to crack cell therapy, you know, CAR T cells are currently kind of producing kind of complete responses. Nothing on the market can do that. This is going to totally change healthcare. When you factor in the times, the risks, the capital, it doesn't really matter. It's still worth very little when you go to market and try and raise money. And because your investors will be backing you, your ownership of your company as you go through the development process will shift from how much of the company you owned based on your founding equity to how much equity you own because the investors are trying to keep you incentivized and give you options. By the time you've gone through multiple rounds of financing, management teams typically end up with, I don't know, Elan, 12%, 14% of the companies that we, that we invest. The value of that, those options will be significantly more than the value of the, comp of the shares that you got because you founded the company. So don't get too hung up on valuation. It's, it's, it's all about um, getting the company to work. You'd much rather uh, own a smaller percentage of a billion dollars than a larger percentage of nothing. So just to sensitize you to that issue. 
Um, yeah. So this is where it gets a little subtle, but interesting, in my opinion. Um, as attrition rates fall, as the probability of progressing to the next stage decrease, uh, probability to get through to the next stage increases, you'll see that the value, this is the, what, I, what I've titled the rolling present value. So that is the value today. Were we to look at this company in 2019, its value would have increased based on all the same assumptions. So you'll see it increases rapidly. So if you are convinced that you're going to be the one that, you're, that everybody else is wrong and you are actually going to get through into the clinic, if you manage to achieve that, you should start to see a large increase in the value of your company. It's not, I'm not saying it's worth four million and that's it. As you go through, you de-risk, you build value. But an interesting observation is that in this middle period here, preclinical development, in this example, we're spending five million a year to fund your preclinical studies. But we haven't de-risked anything yet because you still haven't demonstrated or gone through a, what we call a value inflection point. You haven't shown us more evidence than we started with that this is actually going to work in humans. But you're spending the money. And so what I've, this number here is the present value from when you started plus the money that you've spent. And that's at nine. And then, the net, however, the net present value of, of your company here in 2016 has only gone from four to five. So you've spent five, you've put five on top of the original value, nine. But if someone from an outside source came to look at your company, they'd only think your company was worth five. So the implications of this are don't, if it's at all possible, <coughs> Raise money here that will at least take you all the way through to here. Because if you go to market halfway through your preclinical development, you're gonna, you might get stuck. People are going to say, yeah, you may have spent 20 million, but uh, you're only worth 10, buddy. And that's going to be a really uncomfortable position to be in. Your investors are going to be, your existing investors are going to be annoyed. They're going to block new money coming into the company because they get what's called diluted. Um, and you'll be frustrated because you want to get on, take the money, and, and, and build your company. And so, like I said, these are all kind of slightly tangents to the fundamental analysis, but they do inform us on why you should, do, you should behave certain ways. So what that means is, and this is our philosophy when we start companies, is try and get a group of investors here that although they might be giving you a couple of hundred thousand to um, rerun an animal experiment or something, try and get a group of investors who intend and have the, the financial capacity and more importantly, or as importantly, the intention to fund, continue to fund you all the way through this. And as a result, they don't care that the, technically the value has gone down below what we call the post-money valuation, because they're the ones putting the next round of money any, in anyway. They're not, they're not relying on someone else to come in and value it. So try and, when you go to your first round of investment, try and get investors who are going to fund you all the way through, if at all possible. If you can't do that, OK, take the damn money. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, uh, and so you should be careful about who you talk to about your investment, and you should be very upfront about them, what their long-term financing strategy is. Not just, oh, I've got the 100,000, I need to run the next round of experiments, and then I'll work out, if that goes well, I'll work out what, I need, what, what I'm going to do. You need to think about financing as a kind of, as a travelator that's, that starts here and goes all the way through. Otherwise, you can end up at kind of roadblocks along the way. Um, yeah, this is what I said about, um, about actually the DCF analysis in itself is not used to early measure value in 
early stage companies. But the principles still drive how people think about them. However, they are worth the reason, one of the reasons I'm telling you about this is you should know about them. Because when you do get to here, phase two, here, <laughs> phase two, and, and that's where you have what's, what we call clinical proof of concept, where you've shown in patients, although you haven't got enough data to convince a regulator to give you access to the market, you have shown statistically that your drug, relative to a standard of care or a placebo, is actually doing something positive for patients. And that's the time where you, it's reasonable to assume that if you've done your job, a pharma company will buy your, company, buy your product or you'll be able to take it public and, and one way or another, someone else will finance the next stage of the company. So at that point, you will be valued. People will have a much better idea of um, you know, what the osteoarthritis market is, look, looks like. It's only going to be three years until you get there to market. We'll have a view of what else is in the pipeline. We'll have a view based on your data of how much better we expect your drug to perform, and therefore we can be a lot more certain about the assumptions that drive this analysis. So when it comes down to sitting in a room with nasty bankers negotiating back and forth, this is the analysis that you'll be talking about. So it's worth knowing. Um, as you've seen from this horrible process, which takes forever and is, you know, really demoralizing along all of this stuff, um, one of the drivers of why it's so painful is that it takes so long and the failure rate is so high. And so if there's anything you can do along the way to accelerate the process or manage what we call attrition, failure rate, then you are creating value for yourself. And so there are a few strategies that are out there that can allow, allow you to take advantage of them. One of which is orphan and rare diseases, diseases that have small populations. There are, in many government systems, programs that allow you to accelerate your drug development. Your pivotal trial won't be in 15,000 patients. It might be only 20 if it's, if it's a kind of ultra-rare disease. And that means you can get revenue earlier. And so if you're looking at it today, you're right at the start, you may even have a small, you may not be making billions of dollars, you may, may make $100 million, but because it's going to hit a positive number in half the time and take much less money, your net present value of your offering that you're turning up and pitching to your investor potentially is even higher than the billion dollar opportunity. So think about opportunities like that. And, and uh, antibiotics is another one where they're recently bringing in lots of uh, incentives. And so look around. Um, it's the same piece of technology that could be used, you know, might be an inflammation pathway that you've identified and you've got a drug to hit it. You can probably do 50 different things with that in terms of development path. So when you're deciding what you're going to do with it, do I take it into multiple sclerosis, which is a big market, but it's a long slog, or is there a kind of genetic demyelinating disease that could push me down a faster route to market. I have no idea. But think about these things in the context of fundamental value <coughs> as well as the science in terms of when you're picking your, building your strategy over the next, in the coming months. Uh, yes, the other thing is contingency plans. As Ilan showed you, there's, there's lots of twists in the road. Things go wrong. You'll have to adapt. Those hurdles, those kind of pitfalls, the most important thing they cost is time based on our fundamental value uh, hypothesis, uh, proposition. Um, so when you're thinking about your business, at every stage, you should be keeping a, a, a shed, we call it a risk schedule. All of the things that could really screw us up. And it's a lot, the things that kind of really unravel companies are usually the really boring things. Manufacturing. Uh, did I put an example in here? Uh, yeah, so, so I've had two companies of mine where the first were manufacturing potentially derailed the entire thing. 
our manufacturer of our drug that we were getting ready to put into patients went bankrupt. What are we going to do? Luckily, our um, CMC guy, CMC is manufacturing, um, had already built contingency into the model so that we had a, a backup supplier ready to go. If he hadn't, it would have taken us at least a year to tech transfer out the process of the manufacturer, find, negotiate a supplier, and produce the drug that we were then going to put into our trial. And that destroys a lot of value. And if you're, if you're, you know, if you are at a point where you were, you were hoping to be able to raise money as you went into the next stage of the trial, uh, next stage of development, and now you've run out of money, and there's a whole year until the next stage of development, you're now going to market with a, well, we, we're kind of halfway between value inflection points, and I want more money, and then any investor's gonna look at you and uh, kill you on the valuation. So build contingency plans into everything you do. As I said, it's usually the boring stuff. Um, uh, what can we say about this? Um, yes. This is more about, this is almost more from a portfolio analysis that venture capitalists think about, or the healthcare system think about generally. But you should also think about it for yourself, because killing a company that's never going to make it early is a value creative decision. Because if you stop, if you pens down a year in because you're mice are telling you that you're never going to be any better than Avastin. Don't bother going any further. Versus you doggedly plugged on for another five years, spent another 25 million, wasted your time, wasted investors' money, only to have discovered that you, something that you really knew in your heart five years earlier. You're just destroying value, you're just destroying credibility to yourself, and you're kind of, it's probably going to be a pretty miserable experience. So. Be honest with yourself, kill it early, and go and start your next company. It's, uh, we always say to, invest, to entrepreneurs that we, that we don't punish you for failure. Failure is just part of the business. You have to understand that only 5% of drugs ever make it. What we value and what we, the people we want to work with and encourage are the people who are good at executing on a plan. They built a, a strategy. They they know where they're going, they know what are the key experiments to run, and they've decided that they're very rigorous with themselves and communicate with us as investors that if things aren't going well, actually guys, we should just walk away. Well, they're gonna get grabbed by 10 different venture firms to put them into their next company. So as entrepreneurs, you shouldn't think about your particular product to project today as the be all end all and if it fails I'm sunk it's not it's a value creating decision for your career as well as for investors money to kill it up um, platform companies there is a bit of a um, it would make sense to me at face value to decide that if I've got a technology that has the potential to produce lots of different products, that it should be worth multiple times what you know, a, a guy who's found a specific molecule and is going to drive that one project forward. And there is some truth in the fact that you know, platform pump companies are interesting, are exciting. We invest in lots of them. But you need to understand that in the end, the bottom line is what counts. And the bottom line is driven by revenues, and revenues are driven by products. So you need to view a platform as purely a tool to produce products. So that comes into how you decide what you're going to do with your platform. Because there, was a, there are cycles where people get really excited about a platform that can produce antibodies and would pay for the the platform itself. That's not the case anymore. Pla commodities are, uh, antibodies are commoditized. What people are interested in 
is a particular antibody that's going to solve a particular problem. Um, and what, the, what, the, what this teaches us here, here, there, is that um, if you have a platform company and you get financing to produce multiple programs, there's usually going to be a lead program, one that you start first and is most advanced. And it probably might be two to three years before your you know, next one really gets up and running and gets proper traction. So if your lead product is here, phase two, you know, this is saying it's worth 500 million. But your second product is at IND and going, you know, ready to go into first in humans. This is telling us it's only worth 90 million. So actually, the incremental value that the platform's brought to your product is not, it's not nothing, but it's not, going to, it's not fundamentally game-changing. So what I'm saying is make sure that the product that you make your lead, the problem that you're trying to solve is a really big one that's attractive in its own right and if there was no platform behind it at all would be worth everybody's while. There's been, I see so many companies that have got a really interesting technology and uh, are going down a path with it with a indication because they think it's a good proof of principle that the underlying hypothesis is working. And that may be true, but when they try and exit it, if the lead product is not very interesting, or, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, big disease, but so crowded and so different, difficult to differentiate a product, this, it may be a good exemplar disease to show that the fundamental biological hypothesis works, but nobody might want to really buy it because it's a too challenging development pathway and they don't really care about your pipeline because they're much earlier and the net present value shows us they're not really worth very much. So what this tells us is make sure that your lead program stands by itself and is not related to proving the, the value in the platform uh, you know, in abstract form. Um, so the most important thing I want to teach you uh, is that it's got to be a big opportunity. What, what your discounted cash flow tells you is that if you're not, set, if you're not aiming for a billion dollars of revenue, <coughs> you're going to end up with a negative value here. So why are you bothering? And that's why I think we wanted the health economics lecture before um, was to show you You've got to overcome all of those hurdles. So talking to those people is how you get to a billion. So you need to have thought about how I'm going to convince those people to pay me a billion. And if you can't think about a route from start to finish, then it's not worth your time doing it. So you need to think about, therefore, what is a really large unmet need that I'm going to solve and how is my technology going to specifically solve it? We kind of, we call it a target product profile. Sketch out what is it that you want to produce at the end of the day. Is it in early stage osteoarthritis patients, late stage? Is it, in, is it, uh, is it convergence medicine? You know, where is it going to sit in the treatment pathway? This is what I want to design. Does that solve a problem? How does it solve it? What is the evidence I'm going to need to produce to get there, and if I can do that, can I make a billion dollars? If I've answered all those questions, it's worth starting this long process. If you can't answer, or at least tell an investor how you're going to answer some of those, then you're, then you're either wasting your own time or never going to be able to raise any money. And uh, yeah, so that's the, probably the biggest thing that this teaches you. One more thing is, in the newspapers, you often read about kind of the political, ethical debate about drug pricing. This also t informs us on this. Um, basically, because of all business enterprise is driven by value creation, 
the, dis the discounted cash flow analysis that we just walked through, by default, demands that a drug, that I've just given you a melanoma example, demands that, you, that the cost of a treatment for a, of a, um, re a regime treatment has to be extremely high. And that's a very difficult uh, debate to have because of politicians are under kind of financial pressures. There's ethical reasons to with you know do you withhold treatment to a melanoma patient who can't in the U.S. who doesn't have insurance. Um, but if you can't uh, charge, I've got 160 thousand here. Then because the driver of business is value creation, people are going to say. It's a net present value, value destruction to go through that process. So either, uh, either you have to shorten and cheapen the development process, or uh, no more drugs will be produced if you want to uh, reduce the cost of drugs. So that's just the more of a kind of society challenge that kind of comes out of this analysis. So that's it. <coughs> Um, so I hope, um, I hope you can see that a very slightly dry analysis tool actually drives and informs us on all kinds of aspects of entrepreneurship, drug development, drives us into making certain decisions about how we design our development path. And I'd, has, who's, has anyone here seen The Matrix? At least the first one. The second two suck. But um, uh, the scene at the end when uh, Keanu Reeves has kind of uh, become the one and he starts seeing the world in binary code, that's kind of what I want you to think about in terms of net present value. When you walk around, every decision that gets made in business is about net present value, value creation. And the drives of that are cost, risk, and capital. And it... It just informs everything that happens around you. You may not know it, but it does. So there you go. I'll leave you with that.